Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I am Matt Waxiel Garasimovich. And I am <laughs> and, I, and, and I'm and I'm Cameron Lalana, the drinker of Genmaicha. Ooh. Well, this is a podcast for me and my good pal Cameron get to unwind from our weeks with some Russian literature and a drink or two or a glass of green tea. We'll see. This week, we're going to be finishing Fathers and Children by Ivan Turgenev. But before we get into that, Matt, what are you drinking this fine evening? Now, I know our loyal listeners would be expecting me to be drinking uh, vodka mixed with whatever was in my fridge, but that is not so tonight because I went grocery shopping like an adult and I bought beer <laughs> like an adult. <laughs> uh, I'm drinking, it's called Bodum. It's an IPA by... Half Acre Beer Company from Chicago, Illinois, representing that that hometown. Well, not my hometown, but probably somebody's uh, town <laughs> that I live in now. Uh, it is actually really good, and I sent a picture over Discord to Cameron of the artwork. Super cool looking can. Incredibly cool looking. Love the aesthetic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what are you doing tonight, Cameron? Well, <laughs> before Matt showed up drinking a beer, we previously agreed uh, that we were going to be not drinking tonight because we both had things to do tomorrow. So I am drinking genmaicha, or green tea with roasted flour, with roasted rice, excuse me, which is the best form of green tea, fight me. Um, I had a whole bit where I was going to like redo our intro and be like, hello and welcome to Sober Solzhenitsyn, but that's not true oh, anymore. So Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the green tea sounds actually really delicious. I had some tea today for the first time in a while, and it was it really hit the spot. It really enticed me to have a have a drink tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I had a long day of doing a full day of work for the first time in like a minute here. Wow. So, yep. Nice. All right. Well, eh, it was horrible, but we did it. <laughs> <laughs> well. All right. Well, <clears throat> before we finish summarizing Fathers and Children, I thought it might be good to talk about the context once again. Last week, we talked about the history of Russia, although it kind of included all of Europe in the years leading up to the 1850s, and now I want to talk about the years that followed. One thing you should note about Turgenev is that he was, although at the end of his life he described himself as kind of a liberal, a liberal in the sense of this novel, uh, he was much closer to the edge of Russian radicalism than he was to the center for much of his life, especially on issues of peasants or especially women. Uh, in fact, actually, I read a really interesting article by April Fitzlion, uh, Turgenev and the Woman Question, which you can find on JSTOR. Very interesting reading. Shout out JSTOR. Shout out JSTOR. <laughs> You're the reason I have a degree. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> and this is reflected in his novels through these periods. And the reason why that's important is because you can kind of see Turgenev and Turgenev's contemporaries, who are writers, almost writing their novels in sort of like a perpetual cycle of responding to not only each other but also the society in which they're now living and you can see this especially in say Turgenev's treatment of women uh, although in this novel I would say it's not particularly significant for going outside the norm uh, he does have he has a particularly famous uh, character Yelen, Yelena who was seen as kind of like a a very emancipated character by especially people who are quite conservative and very worried about that sort of thing. And then, of course, at the same time, you've got Chernyshevsky writing the same thing, only more radical, and then you keep going on and on. And this discourse spreads throughout the nation. And, of course, following the emancipation of the serfs in 1861, which is about three years after the novel Fathers and Children is set, you have this increasingly tense dialogue between kind of the liberal reformers and increasingly radical students mainly, who are kind of spreading throughout Russia. In Fathers and Children, it's really a conflict between liberals and nihilists, and now some of the nihilists have made the next step from we need to destroy everything to we need to make it from the ground up, the next logical step of Bazarov's beliefs. And you see that primarily, or at least I would argue primarily, through the spread of the Narodnaya Volya, which we've talked previously on the podcast about. They were a student organization, a pre-Marxist socialist group that tried to raise peasant consciousness in order to overthrow the Tsarist government. Uh, however, they did not have a great deal of success with that. Largely, they were kind of alienated from the peasantry of Russia, and eventually they would turn to more violent methods, especially, as we talked about last time, uh, terrorism, or at least today what we would call terrorism. At that time, the word, of course, had a much different meaning. 
And this, of course, culminates in the assassination of Alexander II in the late 19th century, which results in a harsh crackdown on the radical movement, the execution of many people involved in not only the direct assassination of the Tsar, but also people kind of around it. A fun fact that Dragnet eventually did capture the older brother of Vladimir Ulyanov, later known as Vladimir Lenin. If you ever talk to me, I've got this whole like, thing about how the Narod Naivolya feeds into the Bolsheviks, which a lot of people disagree with me on, but you can talk to me about that. Such is life. Yeah, talk to me about that later. And so basically what I'm trying to tell you is this very debate we have in Fathers and Children leads not directly, but is in the canon of the debate that would eventually lead to the rise of the Bolsheviks and the uh, destruction of the Tsarist government and to the eventual rise of Soviet power in this region. So if you're wondering, like, why is this debate of, of fathers and children, why is this intergenerational debate really important? I would submit to you, at least in this context, this novel is very important because it's really kind of the setting for the the political situation that will come, which Turgenev kept engaging with in many of his successive novels. Although over time, again, he was, you know, closer to the radicals than not really, but he was at heart, as he described himself later, kind of a liberal and eventually kind of found himself on the outs as he was no longer writing characters which resonated with people. Although, you know, up until that point, many of his novels really had had that character where people really felt that it was sometimes even more radical than I think Turgenev himself even intended, which is a theme we see throughout this period. That's more of the historical context and a little bit of context in Turgenev's own life in relation to the greater uh, political struggles that were happening around this time of which this book was a part. I think that's helpful because I think the book, as we will discover, leaves us with a very almost picturesque impression of what the world in the story looked like around the characters. And I think it's important to remember that life, it doesn't come to one of these nice storybook conclusions. It always continues to unfold around us. And I think that's especially important with what happens in the second half of Fathers and Children, which I would be happy to get into right now. It is my favorite half of the story. It features everything you want. Surgery's gone wrong, duel's gone poorly, and just general life gone absolutely awfully. And <laughs> so if you recall last time, we stopped when Bazarov was a little flirting with Adinsova in her bedroom, and they almost kissed. There was a little, little tension there, but it didn't end up happening. So it was, uh, you know, they were eating dinner the next night, and Adinsova invites Bazarov back up to her room, under the guise of finishing a discussion from the previous night about textbooks. Ooh, sexy. And <laughs> <laughs> this is clearly not what she's actually doing. She's uh, continuing their conversation about love and about whether they're into each other, basically. And she's flirting with Bizarro. She's teasing him. And she gets him to admit that he is madly in love with her. And they briefly embrace. And then she pulls away. She doesn't want to go any further. And he he feels like an absolute fool because he feels like she kind of let her on. She let him on and, and that he was expecting some reciprocation of the feelings. And on one end and on the other end, he feels like an absolute fool because he doesn't believe in this romantic notion of love, which he is clearly feeling for Adinsova. So Turgenev gives us this hilarious scene to break the tension in the next dinner scene when Bazarov's old school friend Sitnikov, who's an absolute idiot, as we determined from the first half, he shows up to Adinsova's house the next night. He wasn't invited. He's completely oblivious. He doesn't know Adinsova. He just shows up. And we get this hilarious quote, which I enjoyed, which is, the appearance of mediocrity is sometimes a useful thing in life. And I was like, wow, you would hate to be a character that was um, characterized that way in a <laughs> novel. Um, but he is. And he's kind of a buffoon at dinner. He doesn't he doesn't do much. He's just kind of an idiot, but it actually helps soothe over some of the tensions between Bizarrov and Tinsova and just the general party and whatnot. So after dinner, Bizarrov and Arkady, they go back to their room and Bizarrov announces that he's going to be returning home. Arkady says, you know what? I'll do the same thing. We'll drive halfway. We'll uh, go our separate ways when we change horses, where the road split, and he's going to return home as well. There's some it's a period of resentment between the the two men, and they get into a little bit of an argument because Bizarre at this point is increasingly condescending towards Arkady and everything around him. I think it started when he kind of went back to Arkady's family, and Ar Arkady didn't like everything he had to say about that, as as we know, a lot of the arguments that transpired there. 
So for whatever reason, after reaching the half halfway point uh, on their way home, out of out of spite, out of curiosity, whatever it is, Arkady invites himself to Bizarrov's house instead of going home. Bizarrov at this point is increasingly irritated because he has these unreconciled feelings towards Adinsova and they're manifested physically, which he can actually recognize because it's something physical and not just in his mind. And he's unable to enjoy the taste of cigars on the carriage ride home, which is weird for him because he's a pretty big smoker. So he is just, he's kind of grumpy. He is just not a happy boy on his way home. So they finally make it to Bizarro's house and they meet his parents. Well, Arkady meets his parents. Bizarro already knows his parents. And they're very excited to see him because he has been gone for three years. His estate is considerably smaller than Arkady's. We get just kind of, this is a good descriptive scene. We get the estate, we get some interaction with the peasants. We get introduced to his mother, who's very interesting. We can talk a little bit about her later. She encompasses this dual belief between paganism and Christianity. Very interesting. And is characterized as this old Russian woman who is harder and harder to find. For better or worse, the author says. His father, though he doesn't admit to it, he really idolizes his son. And he has many of the same habits as the mother. They're both very aware that their presence bothers Bizarrov and they try to leave him alone, even though on the first time home, they, they don't do it very well. And Bizarrov comments on how annoyed he was at his father always barging into the study to keep him company and talk when he wants to be dissecting frogs and whatnot. At Bizarrov's house, Arkady gets along well with his parents, but he continues to clash with Bizarrov over women, life, etc., basically everything. Bizarrov again insults Arkady outright by calling Pavel Petrovich, his uncle, an idiot. And we all knew, and Arkady knew, that Pavel Petrovich and Bizarrov didn't get along. But it's more than it's more than politics. Bizarrov is getting just increasingly upset in general and increasingly personal. And so Arkady and Bizarrov announce that they are going to go to Arkady's house because Bizarrov needs to retrieve the things that he left before their trip to Adinsa was in the first half. When they reach the halfway point, they do something incredibly stupid that could only be done by two young men, and they decide instead of going home, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take the other road and we're going to go back to Adinsova's, even though we just left her house three days ago. She is super not happy when they arrive, so they take the hint and they say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to get out of here after a couple hours. Though she does at the end ask them to return soon, which is nice of her, after the inconsideration her guests have shown her. Uh, while Arkady is back at home, his dad shows him some letters between uh, Arkady's dad's wife and Adinsova's mother, who were close. Arkady, who is incredibly bored of life on the estate at the moment, he, he can't reconcile these feelings, he can't do anything, he can't do anything to keep him interested, so he takes these letters and he brings them over to Adinsova's. So twice within the chapter, we're, at, we're, at, we're back at her house. She is in a lot better mood when Arkady returns. Possibly because he actually brought something interesting that piques her interest. Though he he went out under the guise of going to do something else, which didn't fool Bizarrov. I think he says he knew what he was actually doing. Uh, but he, he's okay. Bizarrov's at Arkady's estate. He is playing with his frogs. He's talking with the peasants. He's doing whatever he's doing. And he starts to grow close with Fenichka, who is the servant that Arkady's dad is now living with and has a child with. One day in the garden, he kisses her. And like a scene out of a romantic novel, Pavel Petrovich just happens to be behind the shrubbery in the garden and he sees her. He sees, well, he sees them kissing, though they're not quite sure that he actually saw them, which sets up like this. Did he see us? Did he not? Sort of dynamic for a small portion of the book. And later, Pavel Petrovich comes into Pizarro and he says, you know what? We hate each other. We should have a duel. And if you don't accept, then I'm going to beat you to death with this cane that I'm holding here. <laughs> And that's hinted at, it's listed explicitly. And so B Bizarrov says, like, in theory, I think duels are stupid. But in practicality, I guess I'll have a duel because I don't want you to break my kneecaps with your walking <laughs> stick. Bizarrov <laughs> makes an absolute mockery of the tradition of dueling. He does all sorts of stupid things. I can't even imagine this in my head. We'll talk about it a little bit later because I love the duel. It is super silly. He, he wins, though. Uh, he shoots Pavel Petrovich in the thigh, which doesn't kill him, but it does wound him into the point of fainting. Pavel Petrovich recognizes him as a gentleman for agreeing to duel. They reconcile. Pavel Petrovich reconciles with Fenishka and Bizarov, and ultimately he gives his brother uh, Nikolai, who is Arkady's dad, his blessing to marry Fenishka, the servant. Whew! 
at Adinsova's estate. Arkady is on the verge of confessing his love for Katya, Adinsova's younger sister. Bizarov arrives and, decide, and uh, basically decides to cuck him by telling him <laughs> that actually, Adinsova, you know what? Arkady is in love with you, not Katya. So Adinsova gets really protective of Katya because he doesn't, she doesn't want Katya to think that Arkady is leading her on. Adinsova admits even now that Arkady has aroused a certain curiosity in her. However, the next day, Arkady proposes to Katya in the garden. Adinsova is very surprised to hear this. She, uh, Arkady doesn't actually tell her verbally. He writes a letter to her asking for Katya's hand in marriage. And this was after, again, after Bizarre kind of led her to believe that Arkady wasn't interested in Katya and was instead interested in her. But eventually, she approves of the marriage. The end of the novel is... Uh, the end of the action of the novel, I suppose, Bizarre returns home and he decides to help his dad with his work as a doctor that he's kind of doing in his retirement. Bizarre unfortunately cuts himself accidentally while performing an autopsy on a man with typhus, which will infect you if you're not able to sterilize it. Now, the doctor did not have anything to sterilize it with, so Bizarre comes home to get uh, something to do that with, but he knows it's been far too late and he foresees his own death, which is not hard to do because... Well, he's infected and the disease runs its course uh, pr pretty ahead of schedule. Adinsova is sent for. She comes to visit Bazarov. He can't actually confess that he still loves her. He instead says, oh, I used to love you and all this stuff. And it's a really, again, pretty ridiculous scene. She kisses his forehead. She leaves. He dies. The worst death for a hero. Well, a hero, quotation marks. A hero in his own mind. A hero in his own mind. That's the way to put it. Uh, not a hero of his time, just a hero of his own mind. <laughs> yeah. um, and so the book leaves us on this self-referential kind of interesting ending where Turgenev basically goes through all the characters and talks about where they've ended up. And I'll give a summary of the important ones. Arkady and Katya get married. Nikolai and Fenishka get married. Pavel Petrovich lives abroad and is noted for his Slavophile views, despite the fact that he only really interacts with people from England, which is a fun thing for him. Uh, Adinsova marries somebody equally icy cold, quote unquote, because of his good position in society. And the author says, hey, maybe it's love, who's to say? And the saddest part is Bizarre's parents to continue to visit his rundown grave in this rundown graveyard in their super old age. And that is where Fathers and Children leaves us. Woo! Quite a story where nothing actually happens, but it, it's really enjoyable along the way. Nothing happens? Are you kidding me, Cameron? You absolute <laughs> fool. He cuts his finger and dies. What do you mean nothing happens? <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I forgot about the climactic duel scene where one of them misses and the other like closes his eyes and shoots the other guy in the leg <laughs> and he faints. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, the duel is so fun. Do you want to start by talking about the duel? I want to start by talking about the duel. Let's start with the duel. Actually, before we get into the duel, I want to say that when Pavel like, approaches Fenichka and, and Bazarov, and I'm, it's not really made clear to me whether or like, not Fenichka is into it, because it says she's pushing him back, but weakly. So I'm not certain whether Turgenev was trying to apply that she was like doing like the, oh no, we shouldn't kind of push, or the, no, get off me kind of push. Because that really changes the tone for me, but... Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I think it's it's a little vague. You could probably yeah, you you could read both ways. But it, basically, what it says next is that Pavel stands up like behind them, and like I just can't get it, the image out of my head of like this lanky dude in like an overcoat, like like standing up from the bushes because it didn't yeah. say that he didn't do that. So well, you know, it's it's dead heat of summer. He almost certainly had an overcoat on. And I don't see why he wouldn't. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's who Pavel is. Uh, kind of a creep. A lot of those in this book. I don't think we've gotten to talk about the duel yet, which is really fun because I, I've published uh, a paper on a duel before, well, several duels before. I really enjoy the duel. It was the thing that got me into 19th century Russian life because I thought, hey, this is ridiculous. And I, I, I kind of ran with it. So uh, it's something you, you may not know about 19th century Russian duels, which if you were not a 19th century Russian aristocrat, you probably wouldn't. Don't know how many of those we have in our audience. But um, the, the real big thing about this is that both of them seem to reject the norms of the duel. The duel, at this point, already starting to go kind of out of fashion. But because we know Pavel Petrovich is an old-fashioned kind of kind of guy, of course, he is going to be into this duel. So I, I, like, I like this line. I thought there was a lot of irony and just 
funniness in this line. From a theoretical standpoint, dueling is ridiculous, but from a practical standpoint, well, that's a different matter. And as I've noticed, Pavel Petrovich comes in with this walking cane with the ivory handle, which the author notes, he usually took walks without a stick. And the implication is, of course, that yeah, he is threatening uh, Bazarov already into accepting this duel. And so there's a couple norms that they initially reject. In order to fight a duel, you usually need to have some sort of insult. You need to have a direct thing that you can point to that says, you did this and I would like to duel you because of this. They say, I assume it would be inappropriate to delve into the real reasons for a confrontation. We can't stand each other. What more is needed? And you as a modern viewer might be thinking, yeah, that seems cool. I mean, I hate somebody sometimes. Maybe I want to duel them. No, that's not how that worked at all. You had to have a legitimate thing that you could point to uh, or you were supposed to, according to this code of chivalry and whatnot. Uh, and, and they do not. So not only do they not have a real reason, they don't have seconds to set the rules ahead of time. Uh, Pavel Petrovich, he comes with his own pistols. He gives one to Bizarrov. They, they agree, I think, initially at 10 paces. And then they're like, you know what? We hate each other. Why don't we do eight paces? So the idea being they're closer. One of them is certain to hit each other. And and, and Bizarrov, because he doesn't really want to do the duel, he's, he's doing this thing where he's like, why not add a couple extra steps when they get to the duel? And he's he's walking like a goof. And he's doing this all this other kind of stuff. And he thinks it's a big joke until Pavel Petrovich actually aims at his head. And then he says, oh, wait a minute. This is actually for real. He's going to shoot me if I don't shoot him. And the last thing I think that they do that I didn't touch on yet was they agreed ahead of time that each of them have two shots. Each of them only took one shot in the duel, which in theory, what was supposed to happen was after Pavel was wounded, Bazarov was supposed to shoot again and kill him. That's how it's supposed to work. But no, he didn't do that. Instead, he said, you know what? I'm no longer a duelist. I'm back to being a doctor. I'm going to tend to your wound. And and Pavel kind of says, no, 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 no. But then he's like, you know, I'd rather not bleed out here on this field. So maybe that's OK. And um, yeah, so yeah. I think a lot of a lot of making fun of the duel, which a lot of aristocrats obviously knew was stupid at the time. But there's just something about it. <laughs> you didn't want people to call you a coward in society was right. the main that was the main thing yeah. I, I just i just want to talk about the duel for a little bit <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> that's fair <laughs> i think it's kind of fun i feel like there's not a lot of stories in the world literature that i'm aware of that have a prominent duel scene and this one i guess wasn't as prominent as it was in my mind but it was there <laughs> right i mean it's interesting because even like because we see this whole duel through Bazarov's perspective which i think that's kind of fun because if you're following Pavel's perspective you'd have a relatively straightforward hey I hate this dude because I'm secretly in love with Fenichka and then he's you know uh he's also hitting on Fenichka so I'm gonna shoot him and it'd be relatively yes. straightforward but because we're seeing it through Bazarov's eyes who takes nothing very seriously he even at one point says of says of one of Pavel's suggestions for the duel like well that's a bit unrealistic that's like a French novel what you're suggesting and even oh, the next yeah, morning yeah. he's like joking around with the the second they bring to watch them and it's not until Pavel is literally aiming at his head that he realizes that Pavel is really serious about this, mm -hmm. which is interesting. I wouldn't exactly call it a subversion, but it, it's interesting that we are kind of at a direct confrontation of the fathers and children. You've got the old guard <laughs> who's really into their duel and the, the young, you know, the new generation who doesn't take anything seriously, including the old traditions of, you know, lining up and shooting each other in the head. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. Those important traditions of ours. Those, those age-old traditions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're fun. I hope that we get to read more dual literature at some point. Yeah, so I, I guess more broadly, we can expand this discussion into Bazarov on the Kirsinov estate. Because when Arkady sneaks off to go see, theoretically, Adintseva, but really Katya again, Bazarov just stays. Not just for like a day, but for a while. Which, to me, I get that this is a very different time, but the idea of staying at a friend's house who I've, whose parents I've just met for, like, weeks at a time after my friend has left is absolutely wild. If my, I swear, to, if my friend got up to go to the bathroom during dinner with their parents that I just met, I don't think I could do it. I don't know how he's staying. For, for the, I, like, I, I, I get that as an aristocrat you can do this kind of stuff, but mm -hmm. it, it terrifies me as well. Yeah, I know. So it's interesting the kind of the effect that he has on the populace as it is, because like we mentioned in the first episode, there's a bit of a divide. Obviously, the older generation does not like Bazarov, and then the younger generation kind of does, which is kind of the initial reason that Fenichka and Bazarov grow close, because 
he talks to her just like a normal person without any pretension, without any vestige of aristocracy. And that's, I guess, kind of an interesting thing that Bizarrov somewhat effortlessly achieves what Nikolai is looking for. Nikolai is trying in his own way to kind of get off this sort of stand away from ceremony but he does have enough things holding his life holding him to that especially uh his brother pavel for whom he is not marrying fanichka as we later find out nikolai did not marry fanichka uh, because he thought his brother wouldn't approve because it's like not really correct that's not like that's not how they did it and it's kind of interesting to see bazarov somewhat effortlessly achieve that and how and how that was not well liked among some of the older minded people although there are limits to that certainly Later in the book, Bazarov is speaking with some serfs, and he, even though he boasts to Pavel that he knows how to talk to, to peasants in Russia, the moment he leaves, Turgenev immediately notes that uh, another peasant comes over and is like, well, what was that all about? And the guy's like, dude, I don't know. And they go back to talking about their real issues, and then Turgenev notes that <laughs> it's interesting that, although Bazarov, you know, says he can do that, they're really laughing behind his back. So it's kind of interesting the way that this is interweaved, that Bazarov is not truly someone who is away from ostentation he still is there a little bit he's more of an aristocrat than he realizes but he's a step down from pavel he is so annoying by the end of the book uh, this last line that i got i think a little bit more on the the second read i thought was the culmination of his character and his just absolute pretension by the end where he says, have you ever seen someone in my condition not set off for the Elysian Fields? Those being based on my brief knowledge of playing Hades the video game and my girlfriend yelling <laughs> at it, correcting the mythology from the couch. Uh, the, the the part of the underworld where great souls are sent. The highest part of it for, for the best souls. And he thinks just because he is so superior to all other people on the planet that that's where he should be sent and he says in my condition he doesn't mean his his disease he means the condition of being smarter than everyone else which just it i i had a good chuckle at it yeah <laughs> i was like just i was just like calm down you cut your finger and died <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> yeah so that's an interesting insertion that we have uh, of bazarov as like kind of the the troublemaker on on the kirsanov estate mm-hmm and at the same time, Arkady is with Katya primarily at, uh, I think it's Nikolskaya, <clears throat> is the name of Adintseva's estate. And they're pretty happy. He and Katya are having a great time. They're just, when we rejoin them, they're just hanging out in a field. Arkady's reading. Katya is feeding some ducks. All it really says is they've basically become of one mind. And then, um, boom, Bazarov shows up <clears throat> to wreck everything. Yep. Um, I actually really like Bazarov as a character, but I do also like dumping on him a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, before Bazarov shows up, Katya tells Arkady that he's not really like Bazarov, and she's kind of glad that he's no longer hanging around with him because he's becoming a little bit more like himself rather than like Bazarov. And Arkady's like, no, I'm, I'm like Bazarov. And then she kind of says, quote, how can I explain it to you? He's a predator. Well, you and I are domesticated. And Arkady kind of briefly pushes back. He's like, well, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got, like, cold blood like Arkady. And she's like, are you a predator? And he's like, well, I'm not a predator. Which, Bazarov is a predator. Perhaps not in the way that Katya meant, but... Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> which I think is an interesting thing. And which Bazarov himself recognizes. Certainly not in the terminology that Katya uses. After Arkady proposes marriage to Katya, Bazarov is very friendly with Arkady and, and the day he's leaving the Adinsova estate. And he's, you know, just like, you know, good luck if you and Katya have children, which it's, you know, this is Russia in like the 1860s. Of course you are. Sure, um, sure. Your children will be smart enough to be born into a better time than we were born into. And then he finally, he, he says basically goodbye forever. And Arkady's mm -hmm. like, you can come back. This doesn't have to be the end of our friendship. Mm. And our Bazarov says, you're a fine fellow, but you're still a soft liberal gentleman. Eh, voila too, as my father would say. And that's um, it French, a very bad French for, you know, and that's all. And then he takes off <laughs> to go back to his parents' estate. Mm -hmm. Which I think here, this is really interesting to me, just as if we're talking about the, like, the debate between fathers and sons, this is when you start to see, as I view it, I know people of the day tended to see this as a caricature, but I thought it was a very good caricature, caricature piece that well represented many sides. You see, even within the younger generation, kind of, 
the more reformist side, like Arkady, who is very focused on, you know, his father's farm and wanting to improve, actually improve things. He's got a mind towards like, how can we, you know, take our current system and kind of move that towards what I want. Mm -hmm. But he also wants personal desires. He's not willing to give up his life in order to pursue that. He falls in love and he stays with it. Whereas Bazarov is totally willing to repress those desires. He is really looking to not just reform what's around him, but really build a new system. Although he's not really in a building, but he really wants to crush the system that is that exists now. And I think the best contrast to this, at least for Arkadia, there's no one moment. He is just slowly falling in love with Katya, and he's slowly changing. Whereas Bazara and Aditsava have another talk, and it's very laden with, yeah, I guess you could say double meanings. They are really, like, negotiating, trying to get Bazarov to stay, or at least Adin Sava is trying to get Bazarov to stay, because despite their difference in views, he's challenging to her in a way no one else really is. And although how she feels about that, we don't really know. In fact, the author himself says he doesn't know about it, because they eventually decide, well, there's nothing between us. And Turgenev writes, Thus Anna Sergeyevna expressed herself, and thus Bazarov expressed himself. They thought that they were telling the truth. Was the truth the whole truth contained in their words, they didn't know, and the author knows even less. Of course, the reality of Bazarov is that he's human like everyone else, but he is able to deny those emotions in a way that, you know, is so complex that he doesn't even really know where his own true feelings lie, as is true for Adinsova in, in the same way. See, I don't, know, I don't know if I completely agree with you here. Ooh, interesting. I don't, I don't agree with the idea that he's able to completely repress his emotions. I think that Turgenev points to a couple instances when he is home on his estate, where he leans into some of these more traditional things which nobody can fault him for. For instance, being emotional when you return to your parents after several years, and his mom is, you know, just just crying and talking about how happy she is to see him. And it says, but Bazarov's own lips and eyebrows were also twitching his chin trembling. Obviously, he was trying to control his emotions and appear almost indifferent. I think that he, this is my take on him, is that I think he has this sense of being better than everyone, which occurs to him naturally. He justifies that by having this kind of in vogue, very surface level attractive ideology, but I don't think he carries it out throughout the book. I think he is a hypocrite. And most places. Mm. I think had Adinsova said that she had loved him too, I think we would be looking at a little bit of a different story. I think that he, the thing he doesn't like about Adinsova is not the fact that she doesn't love him back. And he references this specifically. He tells Arkady that, you know what, back there, we took a beating. That's what we took from those women. And based on the first half where he's continuously putting women down, saying you can't be pretty and smart, I think that doesn't sit well with him. And I think that's why we have such a malicious and kind of really angry bizarre by the end that we don't feel to that level in the first half. Right. Well, I think I agree with you. I think maybe I was wrong to say he completely represses it because he does think about these things. Um, earlier on, when when they first arrive at Bazarov's parents' homestead, Bazarov kind of muses to Arkady, Man's a strange thing. When you look from this side, or from a distance, at the empty life our fathers led, you think, what could be better? You eat, drink, and know you're acting in the most proper, judicious manner. But no, ennui overcomes you. And furthermore, he says, uh, I was trying to say that they, that is, my parents, are occupied, and don't worry in the least about their own insignificance. They don't give a damn about it. Well, I, I feel only boredom and anger. So I, I think maybe part of what we're, we're dealing with here, at least in terms of him, his emotional life as a character, is that he, I don't think he struggles with his ideas. I think he's fully committed to these ideas. But at some level, his ideas bring him no satisfaction. And that is something that he's completely restless with, which is, I think, displayed throughout the novel where he's really not happy anywhere, except for he's, when he's throwing himself completely into work and totally cut off from anyone who could potentially even care about him. Because that reminds him of, the fact that there is, you know, kind of a human side to him that you have to keep repressing, and it's hard to keep repressing because that's it's a very natural thing to mm -hmm. tend towards. It's like not exactly existential, but if this entire novel was like written from exactly Bazarov's point of view, I think you just have notes from the underground. <laughs> Maybe not as well written, but you'd have something similar in substance. Yeah, basically, that's at least my view on Bazarov. I really, I mean, Bazarov is someone who I. <laughs> You know, 170 years onward, 
obviously a creep. However, for, you know, being written in like 1850 and by someone who was not exactly condemning him, but not exactly justifying him either, I think is a really interesting character because he has a lot of complexity, which isn't in your face. It's very much implied in, in this statement or that, that he's got an internal life that the author mm-hmm. doesn't even appear to be privy to. I think it also, uh, that to me is Turgenev pointing a big finger at that passage and say, hey, look at me, look at me. Like, this is important. I, it points to a complexity and nuance of life that Bizarre is not ready to handle or address to me. He he doesn't like this this idea right. that one thing can be true for somebody else, but not for another. Because he thinks that people are like birch trees and birch forests, that we're all the same. We're made up of the same things, and therefore we should feel the same things. But that's not how it works out in the story. I don't think that's how it works out for any individual person. And so while some of his ideals and ideas might be okay, and they might bring him some clarity as to how to live his life in some instances, I think he really struggles in, I mean, all of his interpersonal relationships. He dies alone, basically. He has his parents who have idealized him from the beginning but that's i mean that doesn't say much that's what parents do i think you know, at least mine uh, <laughs> um <laughs> and then he has the the woman that he loves but he can't even say that he does it's a sad sad death for a sad man at the end he does send for Dean Siva and she does show up and they kind of have a short discussion and he tells her to stay away and she sits down next to him and he kind of tells her it's, it's better that things came to no end one final blow on this candle and then she kisses his head and then he dies uh very very romantic as bizarre would hate to put it i mean yeah you could say that they had some sort of unspoken understanding perhaps and that they really understood each other uh, maybe well, i don't think they did understand each other which is kind of the you know their personal tragedy no i don't think they did either I'm saying I guess some somebody at some point could come along and say, hey, maybe they have this unspoken thing. I don't think that's really supported in the text. I don't think it is either. I think they, they fundamentally, they didn't understand themselves and they certainly didn't understand each other. It's just so, like, I guess that's part of the irony is that he's contri- Bizarre has contributed to something that he absolutely hated, which is romanticism, like you said. Like, he created this, <laughs> this like, he had a very romantic storyline between the duel and his death and the love interest. And... He loved to try to dunk on romantics and he was he didn't like them, but he wasn't self-aware. I don't think he really lacked that self-awareness to say, hey, wait a minute, I'm doing this romantic thing. <laughs> right. Which I mean, maybe is because Turgenev himself, probably if anyone he identifies in the story with, it's Nikolai. So I, I wouldn't say in real life he was you know, exactly friendly with that movement, which he based Bazarov on in this book. Uh, he certainly does kind of an admirable job trying to portray a, a human being wrestling with that idea, probably mm-hmm. in the way that he might personally, in a way that real like Nihilist at the time maybe didn't wrestle with at all. Uh, but I think it's an interesting, he's an interesting character for what he is. And I think it's impressive that Turgenev, although perhaps he does ultimately kind of dunk on Bazarov by making him like, kind of live a classic romantic sort of storyline, which, <laughs> you know, ends with the woman that he does or does not love kissing him on the forehead and his parents visiting for years and years afterwards. I think it's interesting for, for what it is. And actually, I, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to move on to, you mentioned specifically Bazarov's mother being a very interesting character. And I, I think that's true, but I wanted to see what made you think that. Yeah, she she does some some interesting things when Tegenev talks about some of her habits throughout her life, basically. So she does a, a couple things. One of the, the beginning of this whole paragraph, if you see in the novel, it's a really long paragraph that describes everything that she does that's somewhat contradictory. And the beginning of it is she was very devout and emotional, believing in all sorts of omens, fortune-telling, charms, and dreams. And Turgenev paints this really interesting picture of this, I guess, old-fashioned, if you'd say, Russian woman, which, as he notes specifically, is harder and harder to find, whether we know if that's good or not. Uh, who's to say certainly not the author in in this case and it points to this this interesting dynamic in russian culture that exists today it has existed historically it's fascinating you can see it all throughout literature if you just know where to look for it and that is this existence of these pagan superstitions mixed with christian beliefs the fact that she is super into going to church and goes to church services to celebrate her son coming home 
and she I, i'm pretty sure it mentions her her praying and doing all of this you know a lot of other things that are associated with orthodox christianity but then she also believes in omens fortune telling charms and dreams which are not at all associated with orthodox christianity not in its theology i don't believe not to my knowledge and so there's this this dual belief where people even after the christianization of rus in 988 it is very difficult to transform the religion of an entire group of people. And so these kind of folklore pagan elements remained. And they it's interesting that it's just manifested in Bazara's mother, who's described as old-fashioned, a, a true Russian. And she has these things that are not associated with her, her religion. <laughs> I think that's something that really made me super interested in this novel. Actually, when I was finishing this the other day, I was at work and I got so engrossed by the end that I almost missed the shift change. Uh, <laughs> I, From a writer's perspective, even outside of somewhat our more analytical perspective, Turgenev just did such a wonderful job creating great internal lives of characters in like relatively few words. I would, you don't hang out with any characters a whole lot. You're not seeing them develop over the course of the book. Turgenev really is writing a series of discrete scenes and then transitions between those main scenes. And even even like side characters like Arina, Bazarov's mother, or Vasily, uh, Bazarov's father, are, are given such in- incredible internal lives, even though they don't appear for more than, I would say, 10 pages in this entire book. That was just something that really drew me in, just that every single character has a well-done, believable internal life, and it makes everyone very distinct in my mind just thinking back on this. Yeah, they do things that are not just specific to that character, but are universal, perhaps, in adaptation. The idea of a son coming home and his mother asking him, well, what kind of soup do you want for dinner? I, I want to make sure that I'm making the soup that you like. Like, that's pretty believable, pretty believable in the 19th century, perhaps believable today. They each have characteristics, even this idea of, oh, I want my son to be home, but I don't want to bother him, but I also want to talk to him. It's... I don't know. It's cute. It was a lot, a lot of father-son, parent-son dynamics outside of politics, just kind of the politics of life, I guess. Which is, Turgenev does very well. I, at the very end, before Bazarov dies, when he's just kind of helping his father and just describing like the intense, because this whole time, Bazarov's father is trying to keep a, up a stoic facade, but that's always covering up him, just like kind of on the verge of breaking down crying because his son doesn't really pay attention to him. But the moment that Bazarov starts helping him, he's like, gets so into it and he's so happy even when Bazarov's making fun of him he starts like Mm -hmm. you know taking the phrases that Bazarov uses to make fun of him and like starts (laughs) using them himself because he's so proud of his son and that was genuinely touching and really (laughs) it made me feel sorry for Bazarov's fate not because of Bazarov himself although I think he's a really interesting and complex character but for his parents who are not real people yeah (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. so overall how do you walk away from the book pretty positively even on a second read I enjoyed it a lot. The more I learned about intellectual history in Russia, the more interesting it gets. The more I learned about duels, the more interesting <laughs> it continues to be, <laughs> even if only for like three or four pages. Right. I don't know. I, I enjoyed it a lot. How did you like your first read of it? I had a, I, I had a great time. I, I have a tendency to pronounce things the best or my favorite very early on, but mm-hmm. uh, I will say that I was fascinated by Turgenev's characterization. I really had a good time with his just his way of writing and obviously it is somewhat antiquated uh, and is you could say a bit problematic in modern terms but overall i'm super interested in getting into more turgenev this has definitely made me interested in pursuing that more and also turgenev really just read some banger one-liners so yeah he does he does have a few of those <clears throat> well uh matt before we get going this doesn't really apply to me this week um maybe you can ask me like on a scale of one to tolstoy how how big on teetotaling am i but how oh, yeah. on a scale of one to yeltsin drunk are you oh that's a good question i think i'm at the point where like uh you're going at a fork in the road and you're like you know what i'll make a bad decision here whatever that number <laughs> is you decide <laughs> fair enough fair enough it is much more evocative than perhaps a pure number could be yes 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 yes, yes. um I, i'm just curious how, how sooth are you after your tea and literary discussion. I am I'm very soothed. That's I'm good. on like a scale of one to who's someone who's very soothed? Uh probably you right now. <laughs> <laughs> on a scale of one to me, I am oh gosh, easily I don't know, at least seven. Mm. Well, that's mm-hmm. good. 
I'm happy for you. Okay, well, Matt, <laughs> what are we reading next week? Do we even have a plan for that? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, Cameron, we don't have a plan for that, but I, I thought of one, and I'm going to say it live and see if you like it. Okay. Next week, we're going to be reading the short story by Leo Tolstoy, How Much Land Does a Man Need? We'll find out. The answer may surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like it. I like I'm it. I'm liking mm. my outros more. They're good. I'm really enjoying them. Right? I think you should go full BuzzFeed for all of them. <laughs> I might. <laughs> Take this quiz. <laughs> The music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you enjoyed the episode, well, first of all, that makes us happy, but also grad school doesn't pay very well, so if you happen to have a few dollars to spare, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. It'll help us buy the books we'll be reading in the future. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also follow us on Instagram at tipsytolstoypodcast or visit our website tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon. Sorry, I was distracted by the fact that you misspelled podcast as podcat (laughs) and the script that I've been copying it for three weeks. (laughs) Yeah, I've been noticing that, but not correcting it because I'm not very good at my job. (laughs) Yes, sir. You'll hear from us again soon. (laughs) 